Bill, go ahead and move forward with Lori's presentation. Um, she's the director of the Border Policy Research Institute, which is at Western Washington University in Bellingham. Um, and uh, Lori, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and we'll get started. Sure. Uh, thanks everybody for being here. Normally I would feel like I'm standing in between you and your lunch, but hopefully you'll all grab lunch and keep your attention span going for the next hour. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then I'll kind of give a little bit of an introduction on what my institute does. Um, should work okay. As I was saying, <laughs> I'm the director of the Border Policy Research Institute, and um, I have to actually congratulate Marianne for putting this program together because I think it's a really fantastic balance having Rob with the consulate and having Steve with Penwar because the three of us um, all work together, but we're all talking about slightly different aspects of this cross-border relationship. And um, Rob talked a lot about the importance of trade between Canada and the United States also between British Columbia and Washington, and I'm actually not gonna talk about trade at all, so it's great that he talked about that. So um, I'm gonna start with giving you a little bit of background on what the research is that we do, and then I've kind of chunked up my presentation into three different sections, and the goal with that is that I'll kind of pause after each section with the hopes that um, you know, if you have questions or comments, we can talk about that while we go, rather than you kind of sitting and listening to me talk the whole time. So the first section looks a little bit at the national policy landscape, just to give you a bit of context for the U.S.-Canada border policy relationship. And then the second part looks really at the characteristics of our cross-border region. And then the third part is kind of the subnational governance component, which um, Steve talked about a little bit, and I'll talk about from a slightly different um, perspective, really more on the D.C., Washington side of things. And, you know, when I was putting this presentation together, I kept thinking that it's really hard not to um, focus just on the pandemic because it's so in our face right now. But I really believe that um, in order to understand how we're going to come back from this pandemic, and how we're gonna recover requires a really good understanding of our cross-border region and how it was functioning before that pandemic um, really hit. So it's kind of like, I used to think about it as getting back to the future. Well, I, I don't think anymore that we're really gonna get back to that same future, but we still need to have a good grasp on, on how things were working before. So a little bit about what we do. We're basically um, a research and an outreach entity. We were created by the state of Washington back in 2005, actually as a reaction that after 9-11 happened, there was a huge disruption to the flow of people and the flow of goods between British Columbia and Washington state. And our Senator Patty Murray, along with um, a professor here at Western, Don Alpert, who has since retired, really wanted to make a research institute that was solely dedicated to understanding that border relationship from a policy perspective. And what's really interesting is we are the only institute of our kind in the entire US in that we're in an academically based research institute whose primary mission is to study the US-Canadian border. And every time I say that, I'm surprised, um, but, but there isn't a whole lot of, you know, there's a lot of people engaged in the Canada border Canada-U.S. border relationship, um, but the landscape um, is nothing compared to when you look like look at how many entities and organizations are looking at, say, the U.S.-Mexico border, for example. Um, it's just a different policy landscape up here. So this is these images are pictures of some of our students up here at Western doing some primary data collection at the border. A lot of you have probably crossed. This, um, this is Pacific Highway. I think both of these are Pacific Highway. A lot of you have probably crossed through this port of entry back and forth. And they're conducting various research projects for us at the border doing, but as I mentioned, primary data collection, which is asking people questions that we wouldn't be able to capture in any other kind of statistical reports because it wouldn't exist. Um, in addition to working on the kind of BC Washington region, we also engage in broader networks with global scholars, particularly looking at how institutions in the European Union might compare with uh, cross-border collaboration that we have here in this region. And relevant to this group, 
um, as you move on and you graduate and you start your careers, we have a cross-border fellowship with the University of Victoria. This is something that has um, been around, I think we started it just a couple of years ago, and we co-host a visiting scholar every year, and that scholar travels in between uh, Victoria and Bellingham. And the, our only requirement is that that scholar has some kind of place-based research project. And so we brought in um, a couple of postdocs from the European Union, as well as some professors who are on sabbatical to do research here in this region. And we think it's, uh, it's kind of in the same, I think, ethos as the Corbett Fellows program is, which is having that exchange, moving people and ideas and research in between um, institutions in British Columbia and in Washington is really a benefit to strengthening the region. And we have so many great things that we can explore in this region as well. So in addition to our research, we do a lot of outreach. We kind of specialize in these non-traditional academic publications. They're specifically aimed at policymakers or agencies or the private sector, and they're, they tend to be pretty short and concise policy drafts. So this is an example of a couple of projects we've done over the last few years. You can see the topics vary quite a bit. We did a project looking at how Canadian and U.S. efforts to combat human trafficking are different, how the systems are set up differently in the U.S. and Canada, specifically between British Columbia and Washington. We also did a project actually working with Rob Kerr and the consulate on cannabis in Cascadia. And there was a lot of fear that as Canada started to ramp up to their legalization, which was about it, well, February, it was fall of 2018, I think, so about a year and a half ago, um, that Washington State, having had a legal market for so long, there would be confusion about what was actually allowed going back and forth across the border, and a lot of fear that that might cause a lot of people to be denied entry at the border, or even worse. Um, so we did this project looking at, um, at the different systems and how we might better um, educate the public on what's legal and what's not. And as a side note to that, we also did a project here at Western Washington University where we surveyed the students to see what their perspectives were. And we found that the majority of students knew about Canada about to legalize, but they also thought that meant that they could go back and forth across the border with marijuana, which is clearly still illegal. And then we've done more in-depth projects, and the reason I put this one up there, the Washington State economy in relation to Canada and the border, is because this one is about five years old, and it's one that we're actually redoing right now so that we can help our county specifically, which is Whatcom County right next to the border, think about what recovery is going to look like post-COVID-19. But this state also... Um, as well. So really, again, just making sure different levels of government understand the impact of the Canadian border on the Washington state economy, because as you all know right now, um, that those flows have come to a halt. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So very briefly, I'm going to just give a little bit of context for the Canada-U.S. border relationship. And I think historically, the border has been kind of of a different sort of importance for Canada and for the United States. So Canada has traditionally kind of approached the border as a really important mechanism for trade, but as Rob mentioned earlier with his elephant in the bed comment, there's always been a little bit of a fear by Canadians that having you know, a weak border with the United States could be an infringement on their sovereignty. And then the flip side of that, the United States, even before the terrorist attacks of 9-11, has really always had a little bit of a preoccupation with security at the border and immigration. So it's long been um, a mechanism that's been used to kind of keep things and people out of the country. And it's easy to think about the border as kind of this hard line. You know, all of us who cross it back and forth experience it as this hard line. But in a lot of ways, particularly between Canada and the United States, the border is kind of increasingly here, there, and everywhere. And I'll give a few examples of what I mean by that. But a lot of that comes down to the level of intelligence sharing and joint management that we have in relation to our shared border. So Rob mentioned the NORAD program, um, the North American Aerospace Defense Fund, which has been around since the 1950s. It was really a 
Cold War era response to fear of Russian uh, nuclear ballistic missiles reaching U.S. aerospace. And um, the United States and Canada came together and basically started treating that aerospace or that air um, perimeter as a joint management system. So this is just a photo of what that command structure looks like, and you actually have Americans and Canadians in the same room sharing intelligence. So a very integrated system. We also have a small program that not many people know about that operates here in the Salish Sea, known as the Shipwriter Program. And this is a collaboration between the Canadian RCMP and the United States Coast Guard, so that one official from each organization is on the same boat and they can basically cross international waters and um, administer law depending on which side of the border they're on. So very innovative and there's not very many places in the world where that border policy or that border enforcement relationship is that integrated and literally conducted kind of side by side. And then Rob also touched upon how the U.S. Canadian border restrictions were put in place just last month and how they really were done in a really cooperative way. And those of us who work on the Canada-U.S. border or the relationship were really relieved to see that this was how they were implemented and they weren't done in a unilateral way like the um, flight restrictions from Europe were put in by the White House without any prior discussion at all with the European Union, which is very disruptive on a, a level, number of levels. So this is a good sign for the Canada-U.S. relationship, which really over the last few years has been a fairly or relatively tense one, um, as I'm sure you've all, all been aware of going back and forth across the border yourself. So finally, on the border policy kind of national level uh, scale, we have the Beyond the Border Accord, and this is the policy framework that governs the U.S.-Canada border. And again, it's this kind of perimeter approach which is not saying we're gonna do everything at the border, but we're gonna use intelligence and intelligence sharing to kind of push the border out and try to identify these threats before they're actually at the border. And I'll you. So a lot of you will be familiar with these because you're, you're cross-border yourselves. Um, the Trusted Traders and Traveler programs, you've probably seen the fast cargo. This is the idea that you're a trusted shipper, so you get to use a specific lane and you can go through the process faster. Um, if I was in the room with you, I would ask you all how many of you have your Nexus cards, but I'm gonna guess that maybe a lot of you do. Um, just in case you're not familiar with it, it's that trusted traveler program where you're pre-vetted and you use a dedicated lane at the border and your wait times are pretty predictable. So the idea around these policies are, are really that the United States since 9-11 particularly, has approached border policy really that, as a way of looking for a needle in a haystack, right? They're looking for illegitimate or ill-intentioned people and goods moving back and forth. But the vast majority of people and goods moving back and forth are legitimate. So the idea behind these policies was to say, well, if we're going to look for a needle in a haystack, let's make the haystack smaller and make our job um, more efficient. And these are policies that have worked really well in our region, British Columbia and Washington State. We have the highest number of Nexus enrollees anywhere in either country. So it's really been popular here. And another really important policy piece that has an impact in our region is something known as preclearance. So some of you have probably traveled through preclearance airports. This is a policy that's been around um, for, for a long, long time. If you've flown out of Vancouver into the United States, you've cleared customs um, and immigration while you're still in Canada before you even get on the plane for the United States. So clearly, you know, the sort of time savings with that are, are obvious. The security savings are there because the U.S. has identified any potential threat before they, somebody has landed in the United States. And also, um, there's the ability for, say, an international flight from Vancouver to land anywhere in the United States because they don't need to clear customs upon arrival because customs have already been approved. So under this Beyond the Border Accord, even though it's already nine years old, we were just at the point where we were expanding that policy outside of just airports to land, marine, and rail. 
And this is a really big deal for our region because, again, all of you are familiar, I'm sure, with uh, the Amtrak Cascades route, the Victoria Clipper that goes from Victoria to Seattle, the Coho Ferry, and then again, the Washington Ferry route from Sydney to Friday Harbor. So all of those systems have to transition to this preclearance mode. And it's a little bit of a complicated policy process. If anybody's interested, I'm more than happy to go into the details. Um, but we were just at the point where we were figuring out how we're gonna get all of these um, carriers to transition when the COVID-19 crisis happened. So it's one of these longer term policy discussions that we'll get back to. But to give you an idea of how that might impact you all, if you've ever gotten on the Amtrak train in Vancouver and taken it south into the United States, you've cleared U.S. immigration at the Amtrak station, right? And then you get to the U.S. border, and you have this weird stop at the border where the train stops and CBP gets on. And that CBP doing their customs processing, because right now they still don't have the authority to do all of that in Canada. So once this policy goes through, that Amtrak train will no longer stop at the border. They'll just go straight through to Bellingham and get off the train. And that has a lot of important implications, particularly for these other transportation routes between British Columbia and Washington State in terms of increasing efficiency and predictability of when you're going to arrive. Because if you've ever taken the Amtrak from Vancouver, you know it can be pretty unpredictable in terms of when you're actually going to get to Seattle or to other points further south. So are there any questions or comments about that more federal scale or border policy piece before I switch to looking more at our region? And I can't see the chat box in the window that I have. So if I don't see anything from Marianne, I'm just going to keep going. I'm monitoring the chat. Nobody has entered anything yet. But oh. Gina looks like she has a question. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Um, so I'm interested in, there's been talks about developing a high-speed rail from Vancouver, maybe all the way down to Oregon. Um, so I'm wondering if in a project like that is how important would pre-clearance be? Yeah, great question. And that um, was something I was gonna touch on a little bit later was the high-speed rail project, but I would say that would be fundamental to enabling that to go back and forth because the whole concept around the high-speed rail is that it doesn't stop, right? It can't stop. It can slow down to make it as efficient as it needs to be. So yeah, they would have to have that in place, which would allow you to get on the train in Vancouver and go all the way across the border without stopping. Now the flip side of that is um, you can still get on the train in Seattle and cross all the way into Vancouver and do your processing in Vancouver because that would be your first stop. Does that make sense? Thank you. And is there any, uh, does Canada have any pre-clearance in the U.S. like the U.S. does for people coming in the U.S. from Canada? No, they do not. But they have under the new agreement, which I should also say just was signed in 2016 and just went into effect about a year ago. Under that new agreement, they have the authority and the ability to do it. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I actually, I do have a question. So you talked about things like the Victoria Clipper and other modes of transportation and crossing the border that are particular to our region. I'm curious if there are any um, other policies that come from different regions along the border, maybe towards the east that also impact our policy and sort of. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah. Thank Great you. question. And the FAST program that I mentioned, the Free and Secure Trade one, which is that truck driver program, that is a policy that actually was designed based on the Detroit Windsor region. And that idea that you have these huge automobile manufacturing companies that are shipping one type of good back and forth, right? So they're huge companies, so they're very known to the government. So it's easy to kind of certify them as trusted. And it's also easy to certify them, their loads as trusted because you know they're just car parts. And even though I said the Nexus program has worked really well in our region, that FAST program has not worked so well. And the reason it hasn't worked so well is because we don't have that kind of 
huge industry presence out here, like in Detroit and Windsor. We have a lot of mixed goods moving back and forth. We have a lot of agricultural commodities moving back and forth. And so we actually worked, um, my institute years ago worked with Customs and Border Protection to do what we could to modify that program to better fit our region. And we have a lot of empty trucks that move between British Columbia and Washington State. About 20 to 30 percent of the trucks coming down from BC are empty. So rather than having a dedicated fast lane here, we have a kind of a dedicated lane for those empty trucks to be able to move through in a more um, efficient way. Because when the program started here, which again was really based on that Detroit Windsor model, we had a whole lane dedicated to those trucks who could be certified as fast and very few were using it. So that actually lets, leads me into my next section, which is to say that, you know, we treat the U.S.-Canada border as a homogenous thing and we do our border policy at the federal level, but the regions are really different and the regions react to those policies in a very different way. So I'm just going to move right into that. And it, it does also get back to um, what was echoed before about the importance of the regions in Canada and the United States. So I'm going to show you this map, and again with the overarching point that the Canada-U.S. border is not homogenous. So way out west where we are, you can see the Cascade Gateway. That's the collection of four border crossings, which many of you have probably crossed through. Uh, the Peace Arch Crossing, Pacific Highway Crossing, Linden, and Sumas. And then as you move further east, the only other two major regional crossings are the Detroit-Windsor region and Buffalo-Niagara Falls, and those are a collection of bridges and tunnels. So these three regions alone comprise over half of the cross-border activity between the U.S. and Canada. And I should also clarify that we're not talking about the air mode. It's just land, marine, and rail. Um, flights and air travel are a whole different ballgame. But you can see, based on this graph, which shows each region's percentage of truck travel, of personal vehicle travel, and of trade, that these components are really different depending on the region. So let's focus on our region, the Cascade Gateway, which is that dark blue color. Only 10% of the trucks that cross back and forth between the U.S. and Canada are moved through our region. We don't have that much truck, truck travel, but we have 19% of the personal vehicle travel is moving through our region. So we have a lot of people moving back and forth. And then in terms of trade value, you can see only 6% of the trade value is passing through our region. And again, that gets, gets back to the fact that we have a lot of agricultural commodities moving through our ports, and those tend to be low value commodities. A lot of personal vehicle between Detroit and um, So a lot of that does depend on the commodity. And so then I'm going to shift from this, I have two graphs coming up, and then I'll kind of get away from, from showing you too many graphs virtually, which could be challenging. But this is a graph that shows the number of people entering the U.S. by region, and you can see that these trends are really different depending on what region you're at. So I'll just walk you through this very briefly. So in purple is Detroit, in green is Buffalo. And in blue, there we are in the Cascade Gateway. So you can see that these, these, these have shifted a lot over the years, and I'm going to kind of show you some really important things that have happened and how each region has reacted differently. So obviously we had the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and those hit Detroit really hard. You can see the number of people entering from Canada at Detroit just dropped after 9-11 and continued to drop since and has not recovered. Buffalo, the sort of weren't really that affected immediately by 9-11, but then slowly dropped down and have kind of vacillated since. And then us here in the Cascade Gateway, we took a little bit of a dip after 9-11, but then we grew and we continue to grow. And we're, both us and Buffalo um, actually have, you know, higher volumes now than we did in those kind of pre-recession times. But, but each region reacted differently. There's a really important thing that happened in our region which, again, if you were in the room with me, I'd ask you all if you could guess what it was right around 2010 that really kind of started, jump-started Canadians and Americans crossing the border again, and that was the Vancouver Olympics. And the Vancouver Olympics were really, really important here because you had a lot of policies that were made 
at the provincial and the state level that actually really jump-started people being able to move back and forth. Um, and I'll talk about these a little bit later, but the enhanced driver's license is a perfect example of that. Those were really made as a way to allow people to get back and forth across the border without having to have a passport. And that's a policy innovation that happened in our region that's since expanded all over the Canada-U.S. border. And then there's another very interesting thing that happened in our region that has an effect um, both here and in, in Buffalo, and that's the strength of the Canadian dollar. So right around 2013-ish, uh, 2014, the Canadian dollar was on par with the U.S. dollar, which was almost unheard of. And that drove a lot of people over the border here. Um, it had less of an effect in that Buffalo region, but a little bit of one. And then interestingly, in Detroit, it had no impact at all. And so the reason it had no impact at all in Detroit is because Detroit border crossings are largely composed of people crossing back and forth for work. You heard Rob mention how many Canadian nurses work in Detroit, um, and they're going back and forth. Well, here in our region, we have very few people that are crossing back and forth for work. What we have is a lot of Canadians crossing back and forth to shop. And that really drives our number. So I'm gonna show you one more graph just to highlight the, the closeness of the relationship between the strength of the Canadian dollar and the number of Canadians crossing our border, which again is not the same story necessarily in other regions. Lori, could I interrupt yeah. just before you go on to that slide? <clears throat> I think the, the explanation of the Olympics, I mean, just, the impact of, of a major cross-border international event like that and, it, and its impact on our travel. But also, can you say anything about explanation as to why Detroit, I mean, we know why the numbers went down, but why, what would be the explanation they've never recovered? Well, and yeah, that's a good <clears throat> chance to talk a little bit about the broader context. So the Detroit Windsor economy has really suffered in that post-2008 timeframe. And so the economic activity never really came back there either. That's an important point. And I think the population hasn't recovered. You know, if you look at Vancouver and Seattle, I mean, our population has grown so much that that also drives more people back and forth. And our economy has been very strong as well. So there's, there is some of that kind of place-based demographic and economic characteristics as well. So this really highlights that relationship. Um, in green is that strength of the Canadian dollar. The higher that, num that dotted line is, the stronger the Canadian dollar is. And so I, I always like to show this to people to highlight you know, the red line is the number of Canadians crossing or in number of Canadian cars crossing the border. And in blue is the Americans. And you can see very, like, relatively speaking, there just aren't that many Americans going back and forth across the BC Washington region. We're heavily, heavily dominated by Canadians. And Canadians are very, very influenced by the strength of their dollar. And so that has a huge impact on both the economy of Washington State, but particularly the economy of these border communities that are pretty dependent on those Canadian shoppers. And we've done studies, um, which I showed some of them in the beginning, of people stopping and surveying, you know, why are you crossing? What's your primary purpose? And what we found is that uh, you can see this is trip purpose by nationality. So the Canadian flag obviously is Canadians, American flag is Americans. And I highlighted a few of the most important trip purposes for Canadians, and you can see how different they are depending on your nationality. So 24% of the Canadians who cross the border into Washington are crossing just to shop. But what's really interesting is that 19% of them are crossing just to fill up on gas. And 11% of them are crossing for mail. So when I say mail, this is mainly Canadians doing online shopping and having mailboxes in the U.S. and they cross over the border, they fill up on gas, Again, this has a huge implication for what types of economic activity there is in Washington and how dependent that is on Canadians. And right now, you know, we're entering this situation where these numbers are going to look really, really different when the border opens up again, and they may never get this high again. 
um, it remains to be seen if, if Canadians will be engaging in that discretionary shopping like they had in the past once the border opens up. And I'm actually going to skip the next slide because we're a little low on time and just get to um, a little bit more about COVID-19 and then move into the cross-border collaboration. So again, we're thinking about that cross-border economy. Um, as you all know, the border restrictions uh, went in place. They will at least last until May 21st, still open to essential travelers and commercial traffic. But we're really in completely unprecedented times. Um, some reporters have asked me, well, how does this compare to 9-11? So I went back and I looked at the numbers. And following 9-11, we saw about a 50% decline in our cross-border flows of people. And following or amidst these border restrictions, we see a 98% decline. So we're going from something like 10,000 cars entering the U.S. every day to like 100. So completely unprecedented. And the fact that they're lasting until uh, May 21st, you know, really, again, brings us back to that question of what's going to happen to this cross-border economy. And could there be really a long-term impact on Canadian consumer shopping behavior so that you're no longer going to drive to Bellingham to get your milk or pick up your mail? You're going to stay home instead or shop within your community instead. So a lot of this is stuff that, that I'm working on right now that other people are working on as well to try to understand what the real border impacts are going to be to this situation. Obviously, the economic impacts are going to be widespread, but here in, in these border economies and, and even in Washington State, we're going to feel these impacts differently. And I think, I think we're going to feel them a little bit longer because of that border impact. So any questions before I switch to just the last piece, which is looking a little bit more at, at governance? Okay, I'm going to plow through this. So subnational governance in the Cascadia region. And when I talk about governance, it's not just policymaking. It's really a lot of the relationships that go in to these policies and to different levels of collaboration. So I always have to show this picture because this is what we've had since 2016 and it was a lot more fun to talk about U.S. Canada governance when we had Trudeau and Obama who had a great bromance and who doesn't love a great bromance um, but times have been pretty tense at the national scale but what's interesting is even though they've been tense at the national scale here in the region between BC and Washington, I would argue we've, we've actually increased our efforts at cross-border collaboration. And I think it's sort of because um, we're pushing back against that federal dysfunction. Um, I guess we could call it that. And, and I think a lot of that is because we have a real culture of collaboration here and we are where the peace arch is. And I can't tell you how many times I've traveled not just to other parts of the U.S. and Canada, but around the world where people use this symbol to talk about cross-border collaboration and good um, border policy mechanisms, because it really is a symbol of, of keeping a border as open as you can um, within the need to obviously have it be controlled. So when I say we have a culture of collaboration, we have a lot of institutions and organizations that are dedicated to the cross-border relationship. And this doesn't exist in other places. Uh, last year, right about this time, I went to Buffalo for a forum that was put on looking at kind of evaluating the state of cross-border collaboration at, in Detroit, Windsor, in Buffalo, Niagara, and then out here in our region to see kind of how things were working and the overwhelming discussion was about out here in, in BC, Washington, we have this culture of collaboration that just doesn't exist in these places. And part of that is because we have these institutions and these organizations um, like mine, like Steve's group, the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, there's, there's several others as well, whose actual day job is dedicated to that cross-border relationship, which is really important to carrying it forward. We also have really strong government engagement across scale. So not just between the governor and the premier, but also um, between the municipalities and between cities, between our uh, transportation agencies on both sides of the border. And, you know, what's interesting is 
you go to a place like Buffalo, Niagara, and the governor and the premier are not talking to each other because there's this whole kind of political, territorial thing going on. Where out here, we just don't really encounter that. We, we've had good relations at that higher leadership level for a number of years. And that really has led to really important policy innovations at the border. I mentioned already how the enhanced driver's license was created here in this region because of the Vancouver Olympics. I mentioned how Nexus, which actually kind of came out of a predecessor program here in this region, has been really transformational in moving people back and forth across the border. And so it's kind of neat because we, we, we've innovated here in ways. Vancouver International Airport is another great example. And those innovations have been taken and, and used at different parts of North America and even all around the world as well. And some of that, which has already been talked about earlier by the group, is, is having this kind of common identity and this concept of Cascadia. And I put up the flag as a little bit of a joke because there's this movement some years ago to kind of secede from the rest of the United States and Canada because we have this common environmental, political, and quality of life identity here in this region, uh, but this really translates into policy changes. And I, I work with uh, former Governor Gregoire, and she used to say, Washingtonians have more in common with our neighbors in British Columbia than we do with any other state in the United States. And I always thought that was a really bold statement to make, um, but she could get away with making it because I think a lot of us who live here agree with that. So um, over the years, there's been more and more efforts that are kind of really built up around this common identity. And I'll just have a few more slides to kind of get at different ways that I think we do connect in a unique way in this region. We have a really um, strong share in ecosystem. This is a map that was created by a professor here at Western showing the Salish Sea region, which was named in 2009 as one sea, rather than thinking about it as the Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia. And you can see on this map that there's no border. Um, most of us could probably pick up this map, have a red marker, and you know, draw exactly where the border goes. But the idea behind not showing a border on this map is to say that you know, the ecosystem knows no boundaries. And so when we're talking about governing shared waters, shipping routes, disaster response, we need to think about it in a holistic way. And we've done that really well. We have really strong partnerships between the US Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard. Also, um, obviously, we have to remember that there's a number of Coast Salish tribes and First Nations here that compose over 50 sovereign governments. So that's an entirely different governmental structure that exists outside of the state, the province, or the federal government. And these are entities, um, these are governments that have proven to have a lot of power, particularly when it comes to the transportation of fossil fuels through this region. And they've become sort of more and more organized in their, their governance and their political response. And finally, is the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. Someone asked a question about the high-speed rail project. And that is a project that has come underneath this framework which is really about um, creating stronger cross-border ties between the high-tech sector, between universities, I know UW is involved in this, um, as well as government. And it builds on that long-standing tradition of cooperation in the region and innovation as well. It really um, sort of gained momentum in 2016 when Microsoft opened up offices in Vancouver and really sort of drove this effort to say, we have so much talent in Vancouver and Seattle on both sides of the border. We need to start really um, being more strategic about how we can build relationships and do more by working together. So the image here is a picture of the premier and the governor signing a memorandum of understanding. That funky little map down there highlights a few of the initiatives of the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. The high-speed rail project is one. Uh, the seaplane service between Seattle and Vancouver is another one. Um, there's, there's sort of a number of different initiatives, particularly also related to coordinating between the Fred Hutch Cancer Center and the BC Cancer Center. And this group has a steering committee. I'm one of the steering committee members on here. And we, we've sort of taken a hiatus a little bit given the COVID-19 crisis, but I would say that it's really initiatives like this that highlight how 
strong our cross-border region is and the opportunities we have when we do work together across the border. So I have one more slide to talk a little bit about the situation we're in now and, and how that kind of plays out given this cross-border governance framework. Um, and, and a little bit it is more questions than answers because I don't think anybody has answers yet. But one of the main questions and Steve's uh, group has been, the working groups have been getting into this. It raises the point a little bit to Marion's question earlier about how is Penmore responding given the COVID-19 crisis and really trying to align what's happening in one jurisdiction with another. And you know, obviously you can't dictate what these jurisdictions are doing, but if people are in conversation with each other and they can learn about each other's best practices and at least know what the province or the state next to them is doing, then it does really align responses better. Um, we know that BC Premier Horgan and Washington Governor Inslee are in communication. I think they met last week to talk about how they are, are viewing their responses. But again, we, we find ourselves, even though we might be a strong cross-border region, we are bifurcated by this federal border that's going to take a one-size-fits-all approach. And right now, there's also a BC provincial checkpoint. And I'd be really curious if any of the students have gone back and forth or have been able to. Um, if you have, you'll know that when you enter Canada, you have a secondary checkpoint related to Canada's quarantine system. So you know, that's a whole other jurisdiction that has to be coordinated with, particularly um, if the border, if when the border opens again, I shouldn't say if it will open again. But then the real question that um, has to be grappled with is, is again, can we reconnect that cross-border economy? And I don't think Steve, he might have mentioned this, I didn't catch all of his talk, but the tourism industry is incredibly reliant on people moving back and forth, um, particularly in Vancouver Island and Victoria. Seattle, Vancouver as well, we have a whole cruise ship industry. And so figuring out if and how cross-border tourism can begin again, we have this connected infrastructure, making sure that that's all coordinated. Um, labor mobility is another really important piece when we think about the economy opening up again, um, because even though we have relatively few people crossing the border back and forth here to work, we do have some. I know here at Western, we have a number of professors who live in Vancouver or in the lower mainland of Surrey and commute down here to work. So all really important questions about how to govern a cross-border region amidst the public health pandemic. Um, great masters and PhD dissertations just waiting to be done. Um, and that's it for me. I apologize for talking so fast, but I knew that I was low on time and we got through it. So thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori. I am actually really pleased that we had you go last because I think you really tied together all of the other talks um, into your presentation very well and made it a really cohesive thing. Um, if students have questions, we can, we can go to that. I just want to comment. Um, I'm really glad that you touched on the different border regions across the US and Canada and the differences between um, our particular area in Cascadia. Uh, I'm from a kind of a cross border region, but I'm from upstate New York um, and not the Buffalo area, but uh, it is a very different experience. I just want to comment on that. It is a very different um, relationship that uh, I have seen firsthand now living in Seattle. Um, it's not something, you know, we don't think about Canada very often where I'm from. We don't think about our region collectively. Um, you know, we have bigger bore, a bigger uh, environmental barrier in that we have the Great Lake, um, which, you know, does actually make it harder to be quite as physically close, but it is a really different um, shared spirit out here. So I'm really glad that you talked about that. Um, and if you don't mind, if you could stop screen sharing so I can see everybody's faces. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out. Okay. It shows how what a light I am. Uh, oh, I see it. It's over here. Sorry, I have two screens. Right no there. problem. Um, and then uh, students, please, if you have questions, this is a great time to go ahead with them. Well, I don't have a question, but Laurie, thank you very much. I found that very interesting. I, 
thought I knew a lot about these things. I crossed that border probably 500 times in my life, but I, I learned things today and I really appreciated your talk. Mm -hmm. The depth of the research. Thank you. Um, I can ask another question. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure nobody else had another question. Um, so in the context of COVID-19, it seems like cross-border governance is more important than ever because, you know, diseases, they don't respect boundaries. Um, so I'm wondering, moving forward, just in terms of like your speculation, what do you think, uh, do you think there would be increased testing once the borders do open like I know that uh, there's many ideas floating around about stuff like immunity passports and um, so on but I'm wondering how you think Canada and the U.S. would approach these ideas. Yeah I mean they've already approached them pretty differently um, from a testing perspective and also from a, um, a government perspective and, you know, there's some speculation out there, like you said, about the immunity passports. But I don't, I, I guess I would say that I would be really surprised, at least if the U.S. Customs and Border Protection actually was able to kind of implement another initiative or another policy like that. Um, the Department of Homeland Security is a vast bureaucracy. And um, changes are, are hard to come by there. So having a sort of bilaterally approved new document or, I mean, it, it would have to be virtual, right? It'd have to be, it couldn't be a paper document because of the way that that would vary between governments. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, to be honest, though, these are questions that I really had never thought about before. And there's always been kind of that idea, well, public health crises and pandemics don't respect borders. Um, and the border isn't necessarily an effective place to control for them, but um, yeah, I don't have I don't have a good answer. Um, I think that it's an interesting situation for us out here as well as Detroit, Windsor, for sure. But in Washington, you know, we have so many more deaths and illnesses than British Columbia does, and it's really British Columbia that's more reticent to open up that border, which is usually the other way around you know usually canada is a lot more keen to keep the border open because of, of the trade reliance like rob mentioned earlier so we find ourselves in kind of this upside down situation which again is really just totally unprecedented so i don't have a good answer to your question um, anything could happen thank you yeah i'd be curious to see in the future if um changes would be made to existing programs like Nexus or if there's going to be a radically new program that that'll be developed. Yeah, and, and you know, Nexus is a place where I could see you sort of get your Nexus card because that is all RFID, it's all radio frequency anyway. There could be a place where it's sort of tagged and because it's already a shared database between state agencies in the United States and Canada, Maybe that's a way we could test out if some kind of, you know, antibody card or, or clearance system works. But I don't think the science is there yet. Any other questions from our students? Any cross-border experiences you guys have had getting back and forth from your schools back home after the border restrictions? I mean, I don't have an experience yet, but in theory, uh, me and my fiance who lives in Seattle, which is still where I am right now, are supposed to be getting married in Okanagan, BC in July. So that's been fun <laughs> to figure out. Uh well, I was thinking back to what um, Mr. and Mrs. Corbett had said earlier about how it, it sometimes, you know, one of them was a U.S. citizen and then another time one was a Canadian and thinking about how complicated that gets with these restrictions, which, you know, I don't think that any of us really thought that that was going to be a situation we'd be facing. But now that we have, we'll never forget that that possibility exists 
So, you know, we might not be able to get to our spouse or our family on the other side of the border. But good luck with your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Just an anecdote. I think that's why um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle ran over to the U.S. so quickly because they were scared of being trapped in Canada. They did move very quickly. I was confused about that oh. whole thing. I think I'd rather be trapped in Canada right now. <laughs> well, if we don't have any other questions, then I think we can go ahead and wrap this up. Um, again, Lori, I think you did a wonderful job kind of pulling everything together at the end of our workshop here. And I'm so grateful that you actually stuck with us through the whole thing and listened to all the other presentations so that you'd be able to do that. Um, it's I, I hope this has been... Uh, I know it's been an, an informative workshop for you guys, but I hope it's been interesting um, and that you will have some new fresh perspective to take with you into your exchanges. I see we have only our new students left except for Kendall. Thank you, Kendall. Um, so I think that this is going to be a really good way for you guys to have some, some really good info in your brains as you get started on your exchanges, um, hopefully in the fall. Um, and yeah, I hope that you will consider um, all these, you know, new ideas and, and issues around the border um, and our region and the border as you dive into your exchanges and think about that um, in your classes and in the things you experience in the day to day and, and remember how connected we are and how impacted everything we do is by these different policies. Nadine, do you have anything to add? Yes, well, I would uh, first again, thank you, Lori, and of course, Gary and Consuelo, very much so, and Marion for putting this together. Yes. I yes. Think, very, very good. <laughs> and I think that what this really accomplished is, is very much kind of the vision of this whole, um, of this whole exchange. And that is really feeling part of a, you know, this regional identity. And Lori, I think your slides of the Salish Sea and uh, the Cascadia region in particular, you know, bring that point forward that we are really part of a very much so a very active, connected, interconnected cross-border region where I think we heard now more than I've heard in some time how we're working more effectively even than in other areas of the country. Um, so I think the experience you're all going to have as much interconnection as there is, I think we're all so surprised by how much uh, cross-border study is not occurring. Um, and you all now have the opportunity to engage in this and you really are among a handful of students. There are so few that take the opportunity to actually go across the border and study. And we're so close, it makes it so, um, uh, you know, so possible, and yet again, uh, such a rare, it's such a rare, um, a rare thing that happens. So I just want to congratulate you all, say you're all going to be learning a tremendous amount from this experience. And I think as a result, we'll definitely then begin to have this feeling of belonging to a regional identity versus U.S. or Canada. So congrats. Yeah, and I mm -hmm. Go ahead, Laurie. Oh, I'm going to jump in and say that um, you know, for what it's worth, I, what Nadine's saying is so true. And this whole, this whole um, fellowship really sets you up to be in a great position to take advantage of the fact that there are more businesses operating in both Vancouver and Seattle and more of those companies and not just businesses, but nonprofits as well who are looking for people who can understand something about a cross-border region because they have a cross-border identity as well. So fantastic program you've all set up here and very relevant. Great. Uh, I don't know if Gary and Consuelo, you wanted to say anything before we part, but um, yeah, feel free. Well, it's, it, it was a great program. Uh, I, I think I heard almost all of it. Uh, done a good job of putting it together and it, uh, I think it makes us feel even stronger in our support of the program. Um, I don't know where we're going to go with COVID. We have our normal August vacation schedule up on Yellow Point, Vancouver Island, and 
I don't know whether we'll be there this year, but um, it is what it is. But thank you all for, for attending. And I would say to the students that uh, we do hope that what you take out of this program extends into your later life and to some extent become ambassadors for this. I don't like to call it an international, probably cross-border is the best thing to say relationship. Great. Thank you so much. Take it all in. Okay. <laughs> and, and we hope to be hosting a, an actual in-person reception in the fall for all of you. Well, um, we'll we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'd really like to be able to do that and to give you guys food uh, and you know have you yeah. have you meet Gary and Consuelo in person and get yeah. to meet each other as well. Um, but until then, we'll have to keep in touch virtually and over email. Um, it worked. Yeah, and uh, thank you all again for taking the time and staying for the whole thing. Yeah. I really appreciate it, and um, I will be in touch with all yeah. of you.